nowadays, we've all got a favourite coffee. One shot, flat white. Mocha, Americano, cappuccino. Since the 1990s, when branded coffee bars first hit the UK, we've embraced their caffeinated delights. We can't get away from the fact that, that caffeine is, a, is an addictive product. <laughs> it's something that we, we crave on a daily basis. They have lured us away from our traditional haunts and changed the way we socialise. Coffee shops created more places for people to stop, take time to snack, use their laptops and computers, and the pub wasn't always a fashionable place to be. Three brands dominate the fight for the coffee pound. We have to have great product great stores in great locations because if we don't there'll be someone else that will i don't think starbucks are at all frightened of us we're a microscopic blip on their proverbial posterior we didn't look at costa or starbucks and try to mimic them at all and for better or for worse we kind of marched to our own drum but not everyone is head over heels about the boom in big name coffee shops the big corporates control everything. It's almost the big brother scenario. And one company in particular has got itself into very hot water over tax. I'm not going to buy Starbucks coffee tomorrow. I'm a, I think everybody should go and buy Costa. This is the inside story of the branded coffee shop world, where coffee making is an exotic art, where pricing is an exact science. If you really want the cheaper deal, if you really know what you're doing, you can pay less and where the coffee shop hotshots are raking in millions from our love affair with coffee. Starbucks in Collington Road in Edinburgh, the baristas Ross, Jason and Louise have an early start. Even at this hour, there's a steady stream of bleary-eyed locals. People tend to order lattes, cappuccinos, the stronger sort of drinks with more espresso just to sort of boost their day. Up next, we've got a brandy latte for James. Starbucks has 750 stores in the UK and over 20,000 more around the world. Last year, its international takings hit a mammoth $14.8 billion. Got the Ethiopia espresso on that one as well, yeah. But Starbucks is keen to stress that it cares about the personal touch. We chose Collington Road because it's a great opportunity to work within a really good local community. They serve so many regular customers that just come in, and that's really great because they really are a part of that local community. Usually every morning we can at least tell a good few people uh, exactly by name. We'll know what they're up to, we'll know what they're up to the weekend, and that's so good. We, all, we know all our customers really well. Oh, Thank you very much. Cheers. Starbucks is not the only show in town. More than 150 coffee shops grace Edinburgh's streets. But here, as in most places up and down the UK, Costa Coffee, Cafe Nero and Starbucks are the main attraction. They each seem to have what it takes to pull us in. Customers like being in places that serve good coffee where you can get your Wi-Fi, you can have your meetings and you can catch up on a bit of work and in a rather cool and, you know, maybe you know, happy and friendly ambience. Last year, we handed over £6.2 billion to UK coffee houses, an increase of £400 million on the previous year. Retail sales grew by 2.6% last year, but branded coffee sales went up nearly four times as much. The average coffee shop customer spends over £450 a year on their habit. And the annual bill for a really enthusiastic drinker can be up to £2,000. On a two coffee day, that's a fiver, easily. So that's what, 35 quid a week, that's 140 a month, look at me doing the maths. So we're looking at a grand and a half, two grand a, a year. And that's quite a lot of money. I don't regret it for a moment. With so many big spenders amongst us, there is plenty of money to be made. 
Here's how the margins shake down. Take a regular cappuccino. The raw materials, the milk, water and, of course, the coffee, cost about 15p. The cup and napkin cost another 15 pence or so. Then there's staffing, electricity, the shops themselves and, of course, Wi-Fi and sofas. Those fixed costs add about another £1.20. Plus, there's about 45p of VAT. The average price of a regular cappuccino is around £2.30. So the stores are making a comfortable profit of around 35 pence per cup. Not surprisingly, competition for the coffee pound is intense, especially between Starbucks and Costa. Costa may not rival Starbucks' status as a vast global enterprise, but this successful British company is top of the pile in the UK. Costa has been by far and away the most successful player in the market. With now 1,700 outlets across the country, it's, you know, it's growing at about 150 to 200 stores a year, which is phenomenal success. Almost all of the coffee Costa brews comes from its roastery in Lambeth, South London. 9,000 tonnes of raw coffee beans are processed here every year. This is the domain of Gennaro Pelliccia, Costa's chief coffee taster. Once the coffee comes into the factory, depending on which origin we need at that moment in time, the coffee will come in, it gets split open, and it goes straight up into our holding silo, where we have all the different origins. It's Gennaro's job to make sure the different types of raw coffee beans are blended and roasted to make a standard Costa flavour. Each individual silo will open up, one after the other, first Brazilian and then Colombian and then some Vietnamese, depending on you know, what the composition is today. That coffee is then sent upstairs to one of the two roasters. Whilst the coffee is in the roaster, it turns from the green colour that we've seen to that brown colour. Costa Coffee's roastery is a very modern facility, but the history of the company goes back to a time when decent coffee was pretty hard to track down. Ah, that's better. Never felt more like a cup of tea in my life. Not for nothing do we consider ourselves a nation of tea drinkers. In the post-war years, Britain's tea consumption was 50 times that of coffee, and tea houses adorned our metropolitan centres. There were coffee bars, but they were the preserve of Italian expats. Well, I was around in the 50s, but very, very young. Um, but um, I, I came from my mother, who was, who was operating as a restaurateur in Soho. There were just pockets, uh, pockets of Italian immigrants that wanted to bring that culture into the UK. Now, I like my coffee and I like my brew, but each has its own little job to do. These Italian espresso bars in stylish Soho drew a new audience to coffee. They became bohemian hangouts for artists and beatniks. You prefer a coffee, I do. Well, truthfully speaking, I do, yes. Are you an abstract artist, may I ask? No, not yet. I'm glad to hear that. I'm very glad to hear that. It was about the coffee bar and the music scene around the coffee bar. So I think it was hip, to take a word from the time, fashionable, and not so much about the quality of the coffee that was there. And that's why it never expanded and stood pretty still like that for about 20 years. Enter two Italian brothers with a hankering for coffee. Oh, oh, Costa was founded in about 1971 by two brothers, uh, Sergio and Bruno Costa, um, who were Italian immigrants who came over to the UK uh, couldn't find the, the, the taste of home here, so decided that they would set themselves up as a roasting and wholesale business. At one point, all the hotels in Park Lane were serving Costa Coffee. It became a very, very popular, very, very successful business. But the Costa brothers wanted a bigger piece of the coffee action. They started to open their own cafes. Good to see you. Been shopping. Coffee. 
The middle classes, though, were not interested in Italian-style coffee. The special blend and roast. Precisely. It gives you that richer, smoother Nescafe taste. Exactly. By now, Brits were infatuated with a totally different type of drink. In the 80s, the UK was the biggest market for instant coffee in the world. Make sure you're serving coffee at its best. Excuse me, I'd like a coffee, please. Cappuccino, espresso. Uh, cappuccino. Cappuccino. We had heard of exotic Italian coffees. But as the Not the Nine O'Clock News team showed in 1982, we definitely didn't take them seriously. Just bring you back to story. This is this is early sort of 1979, 1980. So we're in Pontes. We've introduced espresso machines behind the bar. We're in the middle of Covent Garden, loads of construction work going on. I'm behind the counter early morning. The guy's been sent from the building site to come in to order the coffees for the guys on the site. He's seen the machine, it's stumped in, he said, can I have five Desperados, please? So I said, certainly, sir. And gave him five cappuccinos. He was absolutely delighted, but I just had this vision that he would be going back to the building site and saying, I've got the Desperados, boys. Across the pond, things were not much better but coffee was about to get a massive makeover. Seattle in the 1980s and 90s was the tech capital of the world, the home of Microsoft, Nintendo, Amazon and Boeing. And it was the birthplace of the grunge alternative rock scene, propelling bands like Nirvana onto the international stage. Into this hotbed of counterculture and innovation burst the biggest thing to hit coffee since the espresso machine. It came in the form of Howard Schultz, the man who would become the godfather of modern coffee shops, the man who made Starbucks. The in-house in design center, in terms of all the creative ideas, all, everything you see in the packaging that ultimately ends up on the, in the stores. When Schultz joined Starbucks in 1982, the company only sold beans, not cups of coffee. It was a trip he took to Italy that same year that changed coffee culture forever. As he's walking along these streets in Milan, he's noticing just the culture of these Italian coffee bars. And not so much the coffee as the community that they're creating and the buzz that all hours of the day, you've got people coming in and out of these shops, you know, standing, having their morning or afternoon espresso, and having great, very animated conversation in, in uh, streets of Milan. And he falls in love with this idea. I race back from Italy with this uh, uh, wonder in my eye about recreating the Italian coffee bar in my own image and bringing it to America. So convinced was he that Schultz took over the company and he opened his first Starbucks cafe in 1987. In the very beginnings at, you know, at Pipe Place in Seattle where they, where they began, they were a very sort of homemade, homespun business and that was the, the, the appeal. Paul Camel Macchiato, double. Schultz shrewdly realized that Americans would not take to the short, bitter espressos favored by Italians, so he invented a new kind of coffee for his coffee houses. If you think about the battle for the American coffee market, it was to try and get the younger generation away from soft drinks, Pepsi and Coke, introduce them to coffee. So here we have a drink that's got a caffeine kick, but it's bitter. Let's put a syrup in, let's make it milkier. So now we've got the caffeine kick, We've got the sugar content, and that was driven by the Americans. Almost overnight, frankly, in a city that never heard of a cappuccino or a latte, it just goes, it just goes wild. You've got queues out the door, and suddenly people in Seattle are drinking cappuccinos. That was the start of what was going to be a very big movement. Pretty soon, Starbucks cafes were opening on every street corner. Schultz wanted his stores to provide a unique new environment, a third place. The third place was really that place in people's lives that was somewhere between work and home. Giving people a place to come together, 
uh, giving people a reason to come together. 